while all these arms control treaties uh, were thrown out by the United States, we also saw within this time frame NATO expanding despite the promises made after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Um, talk about what the role of NATO is. In particular, there's this perception in Germany and in Western world, I would presume, uh, that NATO is a defensive alliance. Um, however, others argue that it uh, serves the U.S. interests and also divides uh, Europe with Russia. What is your assessment of what NATO's role has been within this time frame towards the Ukraine war? Well, it's a very good question, Zain. I mean, NATO was created, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, after World War II uh, with a pretty you know, simple premise. The premise was the United States, with the world's largest military, was going to, in a sense, provide a military shield around Europe um, to protect it, it was argued, from the Soviet Union. That was the general assumption. And NATO was not the only one. There was a central treaty organization, the Baghdad Pact. There was a Southeast Asian treaty organization, the Manila Pact, and so on. NATO outlived all of them um, and continues to live. Well, when the Soviet Union collapsed, there was a serious discussion. Should NATO be wound up? But the idea was, no, no, we'll keep it going. Why? Now, let's go back to the question of what is Europe. Um, in the immediate aftermath of World War II, in France in particular, Charles de Gaulle tried to articulate the view that Europe should have its own foreign policy and its own security ar architecture. You know, the European army, perhaps, or a French army and a German army and so on in, in sort of collaboration should protect Europe. Didn't need to be under a U.S. umbrella. This tradition or this form of thought was called Gaulism. The idea was we are um, to be, you know, European and independent of the United States. Can't be the poodle of the U.S. That was the general argument made by de Gaulle. So that tendency, that Gaullist tendency remained in place uh, from the 19, late 1940s uh, up till today, it's still there. So inside Europe, there is a dispute. On the one side, there are those who believe that being under the U.S. umbrella, being in a sense a poodle of the United States, because NATO is a Trojan horse. It's effectively a U.S. military operation conducted on European soil. Bases in France, bases in Germany, not France, in Germany, bases in Italy and so on. It's basically a a U.S. operation. Uh, it's not really European. I mean, it would be trivial to call it European. Um, you know, when Trump came and scolded once uh, Stoltenberg, told him, you know, what are you doing? I mean, he's talking to an employee, not to an equal. So in that sense, there's a debate in Europe and has been for a long time between this, you know, NATOist Atlantic project where Europe has to subordinate itself to the United States and then a Gaullist idea of Europe having its own foreign policy objectives. These uh, tensions have been there. So after the fall of the USSR, there was again a revival with the European Union of a discussion. Should there be a European you know, foreign minister, European security agenda? And in fact, those institutions were created um, in the European Union. But I mean, to what end? They are completely parroting the US doctrine. Well, interestingly, after the war in Yugoslavia, the, when NATO went into operation, the idea was that Yugoslavia is part of Europe, so it's still within the European sphere. Although I must say, there was no real reason for NATO to enter the Yugoslavian campaign because no uh, security of any of the NATO countries was threatened. But anyway, that was off the table. The United States was attacked in 9-11 and then NATO goes to Afghanistan. Uh, because the charter, you know, has a trigger that if one of the countries is attacked, that's a security pact, others must come to its aid. But interestingly, with Libya, there was no attack at any European country, a NATO country, no attack. So NATO again violated its own charter, like it did in, Bo in, in Bosnia in, the, in 1999. It violates its own charter in 2011. By the Madrid summit of this year, it became perfectly normal and natural to talk about global NATO. You know, Ivo Dalida, the you know Washington-based um, theoretician of, of the globe, uh, had been calling for a global NATO for now almost over a decade. What is this global NATO? There is no room for it. It's not there in the UN Charter and so on. Now NATO is poking its nose 
into the South, South China Sea, you know, getting involved in the US conflict on China. Um, NATO has become an issue in the Ukraine conflict. Frankly, uh, Zain, NATO is not an issue because after all, two of the three Baltic states are NATO members. So Russia doesn't, didn't have any problem with NATO. After all, for a long period under Yeltsin and early Putin, Russia was a part of NATO's partnership for peace. You know, Russia was not outside that. The issue is not NATO expansion. The issue is what's going to happen in these countries. Will they allow nuclear weapons to come in? Uh, you know, you, you don't need to be a NATO country to house U.S. nuclear weapons. You can have a standby agreement and so on. So, but the anxiety was not NATO's presence, you know, in Ukraine. It was what this military pact is th thinks it can do with countries, let's say in this case in Asia, and also in Africa, NATO has been playing a big role there, and it's it's almost going by without comment, despite the fact it's a violation of the NATO Charter. Let us begin with this segment with the war in Ukraine. Denazification, demilitarization was the reasons given by the Russian state um, to go inside Ukraine and start a war. Uh, it said that uh, it would like to eliminate any threats that it poses to its own security and existence of the Russian state. Do you think that these reasons had any legitimacy? Yes, completely. Uh, that doesn't justify the war, uh, which under post-Nuremberg laws is a criminal war of aggression, which all preemptive war is. But I think it's fair to say that Russia was baited into the war, going all the way back to 1989, I was in Eastern Europe in 1989. I covered the revolutions in East Germany, Czechoslovakia, Romania. I was there when the promises were made to Gorbachev by Hans Dietrich Genscher, the German foreign minister, Margaret Thatcher, James Baker, who was then the US Secretary of State, that NATO would not be expanded beyond the borders of a unified Germany. Indeed, NATO was rendered obsolete. NATO founded in 1949, was designed to prevent Soviet expansion into Central and Eastern Europe. Gorbachev not only did not pose a threat, the new Russian Federation did not pose a threat in the wake of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet Union, but Gorbachev, like Yeltsin and people forget like Putin in the early years, wanted to build a security alliance with Europe and the West. Um, but of course you had powerful forces uh, I would cite two. One, the weapons industry, which saw in the expansion of NATO billions in profits, which came to pass. And you also saw the arrogance and the hubris of Washington, which at the end of the Cold War began to speak about what they called a unipolar world. And by that, it meant total U.S. domination, total U.S. hegemony. They saw correctly that the Russian state was battered, weak, uh, not uh, a threat to uh, its neighbors, much less to the United States. And it felt that it could do anything it wanted, including expanding NATO up to Russia's borders. So I think it were those two forces. Uh, there were frequent protests by Moscow, uh, and as uh, coupled with frequent breaking of promises by Washington, the Clinton administration, for instance, promised not to station NATO troops in uh, the new NATO countries. And we now, I think, have upwards of 100,000. There's a missile base, uh, NATO missile base, now 100 miles from the Russian border. And then we have to talk about Ukraine. So uh, Ukraine which Barack Obama said, uh, recognized as within Russia's sphere of influence. Uh, the, the, U, uh, the U.S. meddled in the 2014, uh, let's call it a coup or overthrow a government that had good relations with Moscow. And then uh, that triggered a kind of civil war. Uh, I think there were 14,000 casualties. Uh, remember, uh, much of that eastern part of Ukraine is ethnically Russian. Uh, and uh, and then Ukraine became a kind of de facto NATO uh, country. 100,000 Ukrainian soldiers were trained by NATO. Uh, there were American uh, advisors, British advisors. 
they were sending weapons. So all of these were clear provocations that Russia had warned against. And we know, for instance, from the WikiLeaks uh, diplomatic cables that were released, fully understood by Russian experts, including the now head of the CIA, who was then the ambassador to Moscow, Burns, who said that meddling in Ukraine would have uh, provoke Russia uh, across the political spectrum. Uh, nobody saw this as uh, or it was interpreted across the political spectrum in Russia as a threat, would per be perceived uh, as a threat. So the forces that uh, pushed uh, Putin uh, to invasion, and again, I am not in any way uh, endorsing or defending, I mean, to understand is not to condone. I'm not, there's no uh, support for the invasion of Ukraine, but it was totally predictable. In fact, I wrote a column at the inception of the invasion called Chronicle of a War Foretold. Uh, so you had Sovietologists like uh, George Kennan called the expansion of NATO the greatest blunder of uh, post-Cold War history. You've had figures like Henry Kissinger, uh, not a figure I have much admiration for, but he certainly understood or understands the danger and has called for swift negotiations. Uh, and end arms shipments. Uh, and even the New York Times, which has been very pro-war, wrote an editorial a couple months ago, said this idea of uh, allowing Kiev to reconquer uh, territory um, was uh, folly, that, that there would have to be a kind of uh, land for peace deal. Um, but as long as billions and arms shipments continue to pour into Ukraine, uh, you're not going to see a cessation of the war. Uh, and of course, this has made the arms manufacturers uh, staggering profits. Uh, you also have internal forces in Ukraine. I don't think the neo-Nazi element's very large. It's hard to estimate, let's say 10%, but they have militias, armed militias, the Azov Battalion, et cetera. And remember, Zelensky ran as a peace candidate. He, he, he announced that he spoke Russian and he would rebuild relations with Moscow, et cetera. Uh, and from all I can read is that these kind of proto-fascist, neo-Nazi forces made it very clear to Zelensky that if he wanted to remain in power and perhaps remain alive, he better change his attitude towards Moscow, which he did. So all these are all the forces that led to the tragedy. Uh, it, the, it, of course, the people who are suffering the most are the Ukrainians. Uh, they are essentially pawns in this power play because the reason Washington is uh, providing the, the billions in weaponry and support uh, has nothing, very little to do with Ukraine and has to do with degrading Russia's military uh, capabilities. Uh, who's going to piece Ukraine back together? Well, you can look at past conflicts going all the way back to the war in El Salvador, which I covered, uh, but Afghanistan, Iraq, anywhere else. Uh, so it's Ukrainian blood uh, and it's Ukrainian devastation. Um, and, uh, and I think we have to be fair to the poor families of the Russian conscripts. So uh, it's a very, very cynical move uh, and very dangerous, uh, as Kissinger and others have pointed out, to corner and humiliate Putin, although that's not gone particularly well, uh, because we're dealing with a, a very significant nuclear power. You already mentioned uh, the role of uh, NATO expansionism in Europe. Uh, just uh, on Tuesday, President Biden signed documents endorsing Finland and Sweden's accession to NATO. Finland shares a 1,340-kilometer border with Russia. Now, all parliaments still have to, of the NATO members still have to ratify uh, their membership. How do you view this development? And, you know, the media here in Germany, especially um, even our politicians, um, uh, tout this line that Russia has military ambitions beyond Ukraine. Um, will NATO hinder these ambitions? And is there any validity to this argument? I think the argument is nonsense. I think it could be a self-fulfilling prophecy, though, if we do what we're doing now and continue to do it, and Putin conceives it the way he might conceive it, um, then we might make a belligerent out of him. 
But I don't think that he has any desire right now except to what we say is our desire with regard to NATO. His, his desire is re with regard to the CSTO. Now, and we say the CSTO is nothing, Collective Security Treaty Organization is nothing but Russia. Well, NATO is nothing but Washington about half the time. So, uh, you know, fair, fair play, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. But he wants to keep NATO out of his territory. That's why he went into Ukraine, because we were going to make my president went to Tbilisi, George W. Bush. And with the president of Georgia standing beside him in a public square, said Georgia would be a member of NATO. You remember what happened then? Putin invaded, and he, now he owns basically a couple of provinces in Georgia. Um, this is crazy. It was clear what Putin would do. Anybody would do it. I'm not a fan of Putin. I don't like Vladimir Putin, but I can tell you I would have done it had I been here. This is a great power in the way it acts, and Russia has the trappings of a great power. As long as it has 11 time zones and such massive strategic depth, and it is an Asia and a European power, and it has those filling stations, <laughs> you name it. It's, it's a country to be reckoned with. And I didn't even mention it has 6,000 nuclear warheads. Um, so you've got to deal with that. You've got to deal with that. And you don't deal with it by saying that they are a vestige of the Soviet Union. They're not. They're not. And the vestige that they're showing of the Soviet Union was promoted by and provoked by us, Washington, with London's help. The war has also driven up military spending in Western countries and increased calls for other countries such as Sweden, Finland, etc. to join NATO. Germany is now investing 100 billion euros in its own military, including buying American F-35 stealth fighter jets that can also carry nuclear bombs capable of attacking Russia. Can you tell us about the impact that military spending at home and abroad has? And will NATO expansion serve to protect the West? Well, there's an interesting situation developing in the Western European countries, Sweden, Finland, Germany, others. On the one hand, they are gloating over the fact that the Russian military was demonstrated to be a white paper tiger, couldn't even conquer cities a couple of kilometers from the border, defended by a mostly citizen's army. So all the talk about Russian military power was exposed as empty, and they're all gloating about this, how wonderful it is. That's one idea. The second idea is that we have to be so terrified of the paper tiger that we have to vastly increase military spending. Uh, Germany alone will, but under current projections, uh, Germany alone will probably spend as much as Russia does on military spending. And it's a far more advanced society, of course. That's Germany alone, not the rest of NATO. Not, of course, the United States, which overwhelms everyone by a huge margin in military power. So there are these two ideas. One, the Russian military is in, totally incompetent, can't conquer cities a couple of miles from the border. Two, we have to be terrified of this paper tiger and rearm to the teeth. Well, actually, George Orwell had a name for that. He called it double think the capacity to have two contradictory ideas in mind and to believe them both. He thought that was a property of ultra uh, totalitarian societies, 1984. Obviously it was wrong. Seems to be perfectly possible in uh, free democratic societies. If you can think of any other explanation for that, I'd like to hear it. There is no conceivable possibility that Russia will attack anyone. They can barely handle this. They had to back off uh, without NATO involvement. But uh, we can ask ourselves why. 
why, why I believe this. Well, in Sweden, it's perfectly obvious. Sweden has a very substantial military industry. Uh, Saab Industries is a major producer. Uh, they'd love to have a bigger market. Uh, furthermore, for both Sweden and Finland, uh, further militarization and deeper integration into NATO. Sweden and Finland are already integrated in, into the NATO command, joint exercises and so on. But if they move towards joining NATO totally, that means accepting US domination, that's what NATO is, then that helps move them farther to the right to dismantle what's left of social democracy. And of course, powerful business forces, right-wing forces in both countries are delighted at this. I should say the United States is ultra delighted that Putin, apart from the criminal aggression, also acted very stupidly. Uh, what he did was drive Europe into Washington's pocket, the greatest gift he could give to the United States. Uh, all through the Cold War, there have been basically two options for NATO. One was what's called the Atlanticist option, uh, join NATO, uh, sub become subservient to the United States, kind of a vassal community. Uh, second option was to become, for Europe to become an independent force, sometimes called a third force in international affairs. That's de Gaulle, the Willy Brandt's uh, Ostpolitik, uh, Gorbachev's uh, common European home. Actually, George Bush the first proposed a partnership for peace, which was not very different from this. Uh, Clinton dismantled it when he violated Bush's promise not to expand NATO to the east. And then the second Bush violated it radically when he invited Ukraine into NATO. But these options were still available before the invasion. Emmanuel Macron had made some tentative gestures towards accommodation. Putin, in his stupidity, totally rejected them and instead drove Europe into the hands of NATO. From the Russian point of view, utter imbecility, apart from the criminality of the, criminality of the invasion. But the United States is utterly delighted. If you go to the offices of uh, Lockheed Martin, they're euphoric. You know. Finally, they've been trying for years to get Europe to raise its military spending. They wouldn't do it. Uh, the fossil. They've also been trying to get Germany to end Nord Stream, but it didn't get anywhere. Now Russia has handed it to the United States on a silver platter. I mean, from Russia's point of view, apart from the criminality of the aggression, it's completely stupid. But that's the way small groups of autocrats behave. Uh, Russia is now apparently run by a little clique of uh, tough guys uh, in Putin's closed circle. They're interested in themselves. It's a kleptocracy. They're robbing the country blind. That's all they're thinking about. And they couldn't think through the fact that they're handing the United States a major gift. The United States is euphoric. Fossil fuel companies are delighted. Uh, they can now increase uh, fossil fuel production, wrecking the environment, destroying the prospects for human life, and they're even praised for it. What could be better? So Putin just, it's almost unbelievable, the stupidity. Professor Chomsky, welcome to Activism Munich. Thank you.
Um, so let's get straight to the interview. Um, in your book in 1998, uh, which you wrote, called Manufacturing Consent, The Political Economy of the Mass Media, you talked about five institutional filters that control and alter, alter the flow of information that serve certain interests in our society. Could you talk about these institutional filters and whether they have strengthened or weakened uh, in our current uh, period? Well, uh, first of all, there was a later edition of that book in which uh, my co-author Edward Herman and I wrote a new introduction and we pointed out that one of the five filters was too narrow, the fifth one. Uh, with the back writing in the 1980s, that we called the fifth filter anti-communism. But it should have been much more general. There's always some invented enemy uh, which is about to destroy us, uh, which we have to defend ourselves against. And uh, commentary and analysis and news selection is shaped to support uh, the state uh, uh, propaganda and action against this real or imagined enemy. And for a long time, it was the Soviet Union. And it's quite interesting to see what happened. You learn a lot about propaganda and scholarship by looking at what happened when the Soviet Union collapsed. That's the best way to learn about the Cold War. What happened? In 1990, no more Soviet Union. Now, what happens? Well, first of all, what happened to NATO? Uh, NATO was established to protect Western Europe against the Russian hordes, theoretically. No more Russian hordes. What happened to NATO? Did it collect, did it, was it dissolved? No, it expanded. It expanded to the east, uh, now right to the Russian borders. Now it's, uh, there's a threat, even a threat of global war because of Ukraine. And meanwhile, the mission of NATO was formally changed uh, to protect uh, the international energy system, sea lanes and pipelines. So it's a global system and also a global intervention force run by the United States, which tells you what it always was and tells you something about anti-communism as a propaganda device. Next thing that happened, a couple of weeks after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the United States invaded Panama killed hundreds, maybe thousands of people, bombing the slums, uh, all in order to uh, kidnap some, uh, someone who the U.S. didn't like and who was finally tried for crimes, most of which he committed on the CIA payroll. Well, that's kind of normal. One difference is they couldn't appeal to the Russian threat because there's no Russian threat. So it was Hispanic narco-traffickers who were about to destroy us. Okay, that lasted for a while, didn't work very well. Then you have to invent new pretexts. The Middle East is a very interesting case. Now, the Bush, this is Bush number one. The Bush administration immediately had to issue a new uh, national security strategy after the fall of the Russians. But what it said is pretty much everything will go on as before, but with new pretexts. Uh, with the Middle East, it said, we must maintain the intervention forces aimed at the Middle East and then came a very interesting phrase, where the serious threats to our interests could not have been laid at the Kremlin's door. In other words, we've been lying to you for 50 years. It's not the Russians. It's what they call radical nationalism, independent nationalism. But we still need the intervention forces to crush that. And so it continues. Everything goes on, but with new pretexts. Well, that tells us that our fifth filter was misstated. It's not anti-communism. It's whatever pretext is invented to justify the continuing uh, processes of global intervention, of aspersion, of force, of uh, uh, international treaties to uh, uh, support the interests of domestic capital and so on. That's the fifth filter. Yeah, now, going back to your question, all of them are operative today. Uh, the expansion of NATO to the borders of Russia after the Soviet Union collapsed uh, was, I think, a, a, a serious error of policy, not just error, that's understatement. Uh, and it's uh, a large part of the problem that's uh, leading to the Ukraine confrontation now. This incidentally was in violation of 
verbal promises, not written ones, but verbal promises to Gorbachev, who thought that the unification of Germany would mean uh, no expansion to the East. It was not the U.S. view. So these are really dangerous developments, I think. These are the building blocks that make up our organization and the goals we would like to achieve. In order to continue our journalism and realize these values fundamental to our democracy, we need 1,000 supporters in our crowdfunding campaign, donating only 5 euros or dollars per month via Patreon or bank account. Right now we have only 200 supporters and are not able to take the next step. Our future is in your hands. Strengthen independent journalism and be part of meaningful change.